You're watching Behind the Headlines, I'm Lee Pacquia. We've seen two cross-border mega-mergers in big law in November alone, and it has a lot of people asking if this sudden merger mania is going to continue. Here to help us sort it all out, I'm pleased to say we have Kent Zimmerman back on the program. Kent is a law firm consultant with the Zughauser Group, and he joins us from Chicago. Hey there, Kent. Welcome back. Hey, Lee. Thanks. Okay, so UK firm Norton Rose is hooking up with Fulbright Jaworski to create a firm with 3,800 attorneys and uh, I think 55 offices worldwide. SNR Denton is also going in on a three way merger, cross border, of course, with French firm Salons and Canada's Fraser Milner to make a 2,500 lawyer outfit. These deals make for some pretty large firms, but Kent, is it going to make them more profitable? You know, it's a good question. Whether to be the world's most profitable firm or whether to be the world's largest global firm is really a choice that firms make when they're developing their strategies. It helps to take a look at the world's most profitable firms to understand whether a firm should be profitable or global or whether it can be both. If you look at the most profitable firms and you get to know their strategies, a common thread that you start to see running through their strategies is that they aspire less to be global and they care a lot more about being one of the world's most profitable firms. In other words, they value financial performance over size. Another thing that's helpful to look at when you look at these profitable firms, if you think about where they get the business from that makes them so profitable, these firms focus like a laser. They're extremely disciplined about going after high rate, high margin work. And if you think to yourself, where does that work come from? On the litigation side, the high rate, high margin work comes from big ticket litigation primarily, mostly in the US. On the corporate side, that high rate, high margin work, M&A work, private equity work, IPO work, that comes principally from the world's financial capitals, the money centers. So when you want to be one of the world's most profitable firms, you look typically to expand your breadth and depth in those areas, and that makes you more profitable. Mm. It sounds like it's quite difficult to be both uh, global and profitable. I got to ask, at that point, what drives the urge to globalize? It seems somewhat almost wrong-headed to me. With all the economic turbulence out there, how can any firm really afford to put profit second to anything? So it's a great question. It's really a choice that firms make whether they want to be global. I'll tell you why it's happening, some of the reasons why it's happening. There's two big global drivers related to economic global growth. In the US, there's a lot of money spent on legal services. In fact, an inordinate amount of money is spent on legal services compared to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. That's attracting the attention of a lot of firms outside the US that want a piece of the action. Then for the US firms, they see the economy growing far more quickly in many geographies outside the US than in the US. Just to give you a little more on that, the legal spend in the US is about 75% of the world's total legal spend. And within that 75%, about three quarters of that is spent on litigation in the US. So in other words, the money spent on US litigation is more than the amount spent on legal services of all kinds in all countries combined. Hmm. That's a huge spend. So if you're a non-US firm and you want to be among the biggest firms in the world by gross revenue, you need a slice of that spend on litigation in the US, and that's attracting a lot of merger interests. For the US firms, when they look outside the US, they see geographies growing more quickly. They see their clients growing in some of those geographies, and often they want to follow their clients. There was a study released by McKinsey recently. It looked at the 600 fastest growing cities in the world. That study offered evidence that global urbanization is accelerating at an extremely rapid pace and it's changing the balance of where the world's wealth is. Mm -hmm. Two two thirds of the world's wealth by 2025 will be in China, Latin America, and Africa. In China alone, there's already 160 cities that have a million people each in them. There will be a, at a rate of one per year, an additional city of 10 million or more, one per year in China, wow. compared to here in the US, where there's only one city on track, happens to be Chicago, to get to 10 million by 2025. That's remarkable. So the growth is happening, yeah, the growth is happening much more quickly outside the US than in the US that's attracting a lot of attention from the US firms. Kent, let's drill down on, on these specific deals. Um, why do they make sense for SNR Denton and Norton Rose? So if you take a look at some of the macroeconomic drivers at play here, You've got, you've got Fulbright involved in, uh, in one of these deals. Fulbright 
has a substantial piece of the U.S. litigation market. They're extremely strong in energy, which mm -hmm. is one of the hottest industries in the world. Right, it's 2011 a was a re exactly 2011 was a record year for energy M and A. 2012 was quite strong as well. So Fulbright brings a lot of that to the table. If you look at Norton Rose, they have a substantial uh, uh, position in the Canadian market. Canada is one of the top five energy producers in the world. So they allow for a doubling down, if you will, on the energy industry, and that's highly valuable for the combined firm. Only so many firms can get into that club at the end of the day. That is, only a select few can be a true global powerhouse. In your opinion, are too many firms chasing that brass ring? No, there's a lot of room. There's miles and miles of room. If you take a look at what's happening in the world's economy, between now and 2025, if you look back at that McKinsey study I mentioned, the consumer class in the world will increase by 70% by 2025. It's relatively astonishing how much growth there will be. If you look at the infrastructure investment that will be required to keep pace with that growth, it's astounding. Just take a, think about this. The amount of floor space available in the world today, both consumer and residential, an amount equal to 80% of the current space in the world today needs to be constructed by 2025 to keep pace with growth. So that's the kind of economic growth that we're looking at. And that economic growth increases the demand for legal services where that growth is happening around the world. Mm. McKinsey, in that study, they released a list of 20 mega cities that will grow at twice the rate of compounded annual GDP growth compared to the rest of the world's GDP growth. Of those 20 cities, Seven are in China, only three in the U.S. Others are in Latin America and Africa. So that's where a lot of the action is in terms of economic growth and demand for legal services follows that. That's what a lot of these firms are seeing. Mm. How can we figure out at the end of the day which firms are going to win and lose at this uh, race to uh, chase all this, uh, all this new work that's going to come out at the global level? You know... It's, as I say, it's a choice whether to be one of these global firms. Firms, when they develop their strategies, ideally are choosing what they aspire to be in the future. For firms that aspire to be among the world's great global firms, often the highest profitability in the world is inconsistent with the goal of being the largest global firm in the world. If you take a look at which firms might get there, most likely, the most profitable firms in the world that don't even aspire to be global are probably not going to be among the ones that will be among the world's largest global firms. If you see the pattern of growth here in the US, what's happened is local firms have become regional, regional firms are becoming national, national firms are becoming international, and international firms eventually become global. So it's the national and international firms that aren't among the ones on track to be the most profitable in the world that are probably the best candidates if they aspire to be global to become global. But there's really a race to be among the top 25 emerging global firms. And there's a lot more firms competing to be in that group than are going to make it into yeah. it in the end. Ken, I'm not going to ask you to name names here, but ballpark about how many firms are dealing with this, um, what has to be a pretty significant internal struggle amongst uh, partners to figure out whether they want to uh, forsake profitability to go after having a global footprint. That's, that's a tough decision to make. Right. And I wouldn't say, by the way, Lee, that they're forsaking profitability, but they're developing their priorities. And some firms prioritize globalization over the highest profitability in the world. That's the way I would put it. But w w you're right. There's a lot of firms struggling with that question. It's a, uh, it's a discussion that happens in many firms. What I would say is if you look at the AMLA 100, there are more firms in that group that are considering becoming global then there are firms that are not becoming, uh, considering becoming global. That is, a, that is an aspiration of many, many firms. It's difficult, though, for them to find the consensus within their firms sometimes and then to find a way to combine to become global. One other thing I'd mention is that when you talk to some of the US firms that have recently decided to go global, some have done deals already, some haven't yet, something that I hear often when I talk to people who run those firms is that when they sit down at the end of the day and they look at their strategy, if their strategy is to become among the world's preeminent global firms, they are increasingly coming to the conclusion that the way to get there is by combining 
because they're not able to do it alone, at least not in a time efficient, cost efficient way. Mm. So that's some of the decision making that we see playing out at many firms that aspire to be global. Mm. How many more deals of this size, speaking of Norton Rose and uh, SNR Denton, how many do you expect to see next year? There's a lot in play right now, a lot of interest. We and others hear that interest routinely. I heard from a firm in China recently, one of the largest firms in China, a leader of that firm told me, for a long time we focused on Europe, and Europe was the place that we were going to expand to become global, but now we've shifted that focus to the U.S. It's really mm. the U.S. where we want to do a deal, and the reason is because of the dramatic size and of, of the legal spend in the U.S. compared to the rest of the world. So I think there's a lot of firms looking at it. It's hard to know how many will actually happen. Interest is high, but getting these deals done is extremely difficult. As you note, it's sometimes it's difficult to build consensus within the firms to get a deal done, but then also matching up two firms that work matching two firms that work on a profitability level, matching two firms that are able to double down on uh, industry expertise and other areas of focus. It's not easy to get them done, but we see a huge wave of interest, and that wave's been growing. All right. Ken Zimmerman from the Zuckheiser Group. Thank you so much for your time today, sir. You bet. If you'd like to learn more about the cases and issues we just discussed, be sure to go check out our offerings on BloombergLaw.com and also on the Bloomberg Terminal. You can follow more of our updates on Twitter, and you can see our videos on YouTube. I'm Lee Pacquia. Thanks for watching.